Brent, never look better, man, on that West Coast. That oh. sunlight's treating you well. What do you think, Trevor Lawrence? Yeah, I haven't seen sun, by the way, in forever. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's just been foggy. Um, I, I think the sun was trying to peek out this morning, uh, bright and early here in California. But, uh, hey, guys, uh, listen, we jumped in with it yesterday. We've been talking about this for months. You guys just been talking about it. Um, I was trying to think of, okay, what haven't we talked about? And really, it's, I mean, I think we've talked about just about every layer. But take it person by person, I think, is kind of the interesting way to do it. And I've said this for weeks and months. Shad Khan probably has never written a check faster, and I think with a bigger smile on his face. Uh, I think he's excited to have this part of it. At franchise quarterback, he knows you need to find that to be able to win in the NFL, and I think he's just geeked up about it. Uh, with everything else going on in this organization, this is the piece, right? I mean, you find the quarterback, and now you find um, – you find the head coach and you renovate the stadium and you do everything to stabilize the organization. But the quarterback is really the centerpiece of that. How about Trent Baalke? Uh, you know, we've had this kind of smirk every time you bring up Trent Baalke these last few months. But, I mean, this could be a legacy play for him. If it works, I mean, he's going to look like, wow, uh, look what he did in Jacksonville, right? From drafting him, I know it was an easy pick, to now the signing of Josh Allen, to the signing of Trevor Lawrence. And then you take Doug Peterson. I think this guy's the missing link here, fellas. And let's talk a little bit more about it. And I want to get your thoughts on it. But Doug Peterson knows what good is. Isn't that the guy we should trust? I mean, he grew up around quarterbacks like Dan Marino and Brett Favre. He saw it firsthand. He won Super Bowl with quarterbacks that really weren't franchise guys. But he knows what it takes. Uh, obviously, been around Andy Reid. And Andy Reid's tree has been around quarterbacks. They know what it takes. So I think his belief in Trevor Lawrence, his sign-off on Trevor Lawrence, the guys that he has like Mike McCoy and, and others on that staff that have been around this league for a long time that continue to praise Trevor Lawrence and say, this is what a franchise quarterback looks like. This is a quarterback that you pay. I think Austin and Casey, I think that might be the piece people aren't talking about enough is that Doug said, yeah, this is the guy. No, I hear you, but keep in mind, Doug Peterson left Philadelphia because of a decision to play Nate Sudfeld over Jalen Hurts, and the locker room didn't really agree with that, and he, he, he caught some controversy with that. But no, overall, I do agree with you, Brent, where I say Doug Peterson knows what a great quarterback looks like. Casey actually had a great point before he went to break here. How much pressure now is on Doug Peterson? Because regardless of what happens to Trevor Lawrence, like you are pot committed. You have established now that Trevor Lawrence is going to be in this locker room, going to be on that field, going to be in this city for an extended period of time for a long time to come. It's on Doug Peterson now to get the best out of Trevor Lawrence. So is there actually more pre uh, pressure right now on Doug Peterson than there is Trevor Lawrence? Well, I, I don't feel that, and this is going to sound a little flippant when I say it, but Doug's got a Lombardi trophy already, you know? I mean, he's making good money. If it doesn't work out in coaching, it doesn't work out in coaching. That's kind of the way it is in the life of the NFL. I'm not telling you he's thinking that, but there is that reality, right? I mean, he, he's, he's going to go find a golf course at the end of the day if it doesn't work out. But I think what you're basically referencing is, is how much of a legacy play is this for him? He's got a chance to win with the Philadelphia Eagles, with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Can he get the most out of Trevor Lawrence? Can he be the guy that helps uh, tutor and mentor and develop the next great quarterback in the NFL? And to that, Casey, I think there is pressure. I think there's legacy again. I think there's internal ego with this business, right? Um, I, I, my first comment, I don't want to tell you that Doug doesn't care or he doesn't want to you know, win and all that. I'm not trying to say that. Um, I, I just don't know if there's pressure necessarily on him, but I do think there's a legacy in play, Casey, for, for Doug, because again, he knows what it looks like. He's got to tell Shad Khan and Trent Falky, this is what it looks like. I believe in him and we're going to get him to the mountaintop. That's why he's worth the money. For sure. I mean, you, you have to make the right decisions. I mean, play calling something that you guys have talked about a lot. Like now there's that part that goes into play. If, if Doug's truly not going to call the plays, he needs to be absolutely positive that Press Taylor's that guy because your quarterback is now, I he's been paid, so you don't have to worry about that part, but everything's on the line like it has been, Brent. But I go back, the reason that I kind of sparked that idea is last year at the end of the year, I understand epic collapse, right? But I remember us having the conversation of what if they do this again and they underachieve again. Your rumblings of is Doug Peterson still going to be here? So I just think there is pressure on Doug, and, and I get it. He doesn't need to work. I'm I'm with you there. But like it would be, I think, a wild thing to pay your quarterback fifty five million dollars if you underachieve, and then 
you maybe get rid of your coach, and now you're looking for this again, and you go from Doug Peterson, a guy that is a quarterback whisperer, a guy that won a Super Bowl, to a guy that isn't here after you paid Trevor Lawrence $55 million. So I do think as much as there's pressure on Trevor to keep his head coach here, there's pressure on Doug Peterson to put Trevor Lawrence in the best spot, or else you might be looking for another coach again. And Brett, to kind of follow up on Casey's point real quick here, I mean, if you look at Joe Burrow, when he signed his contract, there's no talks of, oh yeah, th- that whole organization, that coaching staff will be there for a while. Same thing with Jared Goff now right. being paid the money he's being. Like Dan Campbell isn't going anywhere. Justin Herbert is the outlier. Justin Herbert has had to endure a little bit. The Chargers are the outlier here. Lamar but Jackson. Lamar Jackson is a guy who is in a very stable organization with a coach that's been there, maybe the longest tenured coach right now in the NFL. And then we'll see with Sirianni, with Jalen Hurts, you know, because those are the guys that make $50 million or more on an average salary. So, yeah, Brent, to kind of go with Casey a little bit, I, I do think there is a little added pressure now on Doug Peterson. Like, I understand that he has won a Super Bowl, and that carries a lot of weight, but so has Mike McCarthy. And a lot of people and Mike McCarthy right now in Dallas are saying, who cares about the Super Bowl? Are you going to, like, produce or not? Yeah, I, I think, listen, you guys, this is a great conversation with Doug. Um, and by the way, we're playing a little Connect Four over here. Um, okay. I think that's the noise you're hearing, so I hope <laughs> we win. Um, he doesn't care. We have a show. And good for him. He's yeah. on vacation, most likely, this little guy. Uh, I'm like, what is going on here? I thought someone right was outside, dropping like, plates in the back of the I thought kitchen. you were at breakfast. I'm well, not going to lie. Yeah, I was I thought too. Yeah. Well, listen, it took a while to find. I went to Starbucks, of course, the one Starbucks in the world. <laughs> That uh, the uh, Wi-Fi didn't work. And then breakfast is right here. You guys want a pancake? You want a little cereal? <laughs> Fruit Loops? Like, I'm just, like, plopped down in some kid's room right now in, in the hotel area. <laughs> like, <laughs> whatever, right? Hey, hey really man, do what you got to do, bro. Yeah, it's called being a professional. <laughs> or not. Or not. Uh, but, <laughs> but back to uh, – this is this is what's cool, I think, about this conversation with Doug and and really um, and Trevor because I I want to keep reminding myself of the conversations Casey we've had and Austin if you go all the way back to when he was drafting we were on ESPN six ninety and we we're doing these shows and there are a couple of things that I I kept saying or we kept saying I, and you were sort of hoping at that time you didn't know but. This was a guy that always won, right? I mean, he knows how to win. And Doug knows how to win. Doug's been around winners. Uh, Doug has won himself. And so I really like that. I don't think we can lose sight of that. These guys know what it takes to get there. Now, Trevor doesn't know what it takes to get there in the NFL. But you got a feeling when you know how to win at all levels, you'll eventually figure out how to win. And I love that about these guys. Mm -hmm. I also think the fact that they're married together gives you the opportunity to have something that everybody dreams about in the NFL, that quarterback-coach combo that Reed Mahomes, that Brady Belichick, you know, all those kind of combos. Now, sometimes they morph into different, you know, regimes and things like that. But the bottom line is if you can keep coach and quarterback together for a bit, your chances of winning really go up. And then let's just domino affect this a little bit. This situation, Trevor's situation, if he performs to where he needs to perform or, or everybody wants him to perform, probably gets a guy like Press Taylor a head coaching job somewhere as mm-hmm. well. So, I mean, if those guys can do – there's motivation all over the place, right? From legacy plays to uh, future jobs to winning. Again, these guys, and you know this better than all of us, Austin, these are 1% guys. This check is going to go in the bank, and I don't think it changes who Trevor Lawrence is. It might even drive him a little bit more to live up to it. Some guys do change with money, and you know that. You saw that in locker rooms. I don't think this guy does because all those other things are in play. Everybody that's kind of supported him, everybody that's been insulated around him, he gets a chance to now go help others out. That could be in the tune of a foundation here in Jacksonville that he really loves being in this area and city, but it really can help people inside the building. Receivers make money. Young players make money. Uh, Press Taylor get a head coaching job. So there's a lot of tentacles to a deal like this that if you start looking now three years in going on year four to the next, you know, three, four, five, six years of what this could look like in Jacksonville. But what it really needs to look like is a lot of wins, a lot of playoff appearances and hopefully raising that Lombardi trophy someday. That's the significance of a deal like this on so many other people and obviously on the city and franchise. Yeah, listen, I mean, I think we're all, I speak for all of us here when we say we're confident that this really isn't going to change Trevor Lawrence. Now, if it's the first day of training camp and he pulls up with a Louis Vuitton suit, a big gold chain, and a grill in, uh, yeah, I'm going to be nervous. Be I'm sick, gonna, though, huh? I'm going to hit the panic button a little bit, Casey. I'm going to hit the panic though. button and say, what have we done? 
Okay, but until that time, I'm all on board for this. Um, Brent, you mentioned it. That Trevor Lawrence, wherever he's been, he's been a winner. All, all the guy does do is win. I make the argument and say, in case I want to come in on this, I make the argument and say, he is a winner, yes. Now, I don't know his high school resume in terms of the, t- the teammates that he had, the coaches that he had, but I do know in college he had a great environment to flourish in. He comes to Jacksonville, Urban Meyer. It wasn't a, it wasn't a match made in heaven. We were excited for it. A lot of people were excited for it, but it didn't work out. Right. It was a nightmare, and it was a detriment. And one could say that detriment, the detriment of an offensive line that kind of let him down last year, all those things could have been put into play in terms of why Trevor Lawrence got paid so much. Because if I'm the agent, I'm going, look at what my my client had to go through the first year that Urban Meyer. Look at what my client had to go through in terms of the weapons, in terms of the offensive line. Those are all things that counted, I think, in Trevor Lawrence getting paid what he did. But now Casey comes to the question. Does he have everything that he needs to be successful because to me, yes, there's going to be pressure on Trevor Lawrence, obviously. There's going to be pressure on Doug Peterson, but there should be pressure on this entire franchise now to say, do you have what you need to succeed? I think, and I said this a while ago, but I think the biggest thing that they needed to succeed on offense was to be able to run the football effectively Mm. because I said it earlier this week, I'll say it again. In my opinion, outside of quarterback, the best player on their team is Travis Etienne. And we went back and forth about you know the Tank yeah. Bigsby thing. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think if you could get Travis Etienne going more efficiently, if you're able to not do stupid stuff on third and fourth and one to easily move the chains, like that helps Trevor Lawrence. All of that does. So I think the idea that they've upgraded at center will make everything better. They have to prove it. I get it. He's an older player. That's fine. But if they can, if that upgrade actually comes to be true, then I think they've done enough around him because you think at the wide receiver position, Christian Kirk fully healthy. When he's been fully healthy on the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Jacksonville Jaguars have been a good team, right? When he has been out or not fully healthy, not a good team. Mm -hmm. Can Gabe Davis be Zay Jones? Or better. Or better. We'll see. That's a big question. And then what do you get from the first-round rookie receiver? But you should expect good things from a first-round receiver. I get it. It may take a little bit of time. And you may have a top – three tight end in the league. Mm -hmm. So I think on offense, with the addition of Brian Thomas Jr., with the addition of you think you can run the football for a yard or two up the middle, I do think they have around them, around him, what they need to succeed. Now it's up to Trevor to do something that I think you said yesterday or two days ago is a great point, not play outside of himself. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I agree with you here, Casey. I think he has all the tools now to be successful. And Brent, when we talk about you know, taking the next step. Now, it almost feels like, at least in this city, that a giant weight's been lifted off everyone's shoulders, right? Like, we all saw this coming. It still had to happen and everything, but we all knew it was going to happen. Okay, so that part's done. I guess the question next now, Brent, is, well, what's next from this team? Do you, are you missing anything? Do you do you need to sign anybody else? Do you need to pay anybody else? Or now he's put it in cruise control and go to training camp? Yeah, first of all, I love what uh, Casey was just saying. That's a great conversation. That's a great question. Uh, We just put it on social media, too. Does he have everything he needs to succeed? And then what I think the next level of that question, uh, before I I tell you, I think what's next, is when does that transition? I talked a little bit last night when Marcel and I jumped on. When does that transition to, okay, you have a big contract. We can't pay everybody else around us. And so or we're, we're winning games, so now we don't have top 15 picks to go get everybody else with like lottery picks and big time players and blue chippers. When do you take over and be, I make everybody else better, right? Patrick Mahomes did not have the team he had five years ago this year and he makes everybody else better and they still won football games. Tom Brady did that many times in his career. So you're going to have to get to that stage when you've got the $55 million price tag on you. I mean, that's just the cost of doing business from a quarterback perspective and the investment in the NFL. One last thought on what uh, Casey just said, though. They have invested, guys. Forget about the players and how you think they are. Just look at the investment they've put around Trevor. Mm-hmm. His deal now, ETN first-round pick. Bigsby actually third-round pick. They went out and got a free agent center where they thought they messed up on the center position most likely and upgraded. They've got a $20 million right guard. They've got a first-round right tackle. They've got a $21 million left tackle. They just paid their Ezra Cleveland a new deal. They paid their tight end. They paid Christian Kirk. They paid Gabe Davis. They went and got a first-round pick in Brian Thomas Jr. I mean, they, they, they're they invested. And obviously in their staff and Doug and everybody else, he's making good money. I mean, 
they are invested around Trevor. Now, did they make all the right decisions? Did those guys do their job? How does it all mesh together? I mean, we don't know that until Sunday's in September. But the bottom line is, I don't know how you can sit here and say they're not invested around Trevor. They have done everything to put him in a really good position, I think, for, for what they believe is a top 10, at least quarterback in the NFL, where he now has to go deliver. All right, what's next? Well, really the next, I think, and I think this was I, I got to be careful here. I do not think this is why the deal got done, but I think it was a little extra motivation to make it happen now instead of before training camp on the Jags part. July, June 25th is coming up. That city council meeting with the renovation of the stadium. Why not check one more box? Get everybody buzzing in Jacksonville. Get everybody feeling good about their guy who's going to usher in this new stadium by the time we get to 2028 and then into the 2030s decade and say, here's our guy, the house that Trevor built, right? Why not? And I think they just did that with about 10, 11 days to go now until that big vote most likely or could happen with city council and that new renovation. So that's really what's next uh, in the next couple of weeks. Beyond that, from a playing standpoint, I think you got to keep an eye on Tyson Campbell. Uh, how do they feel about him? They've got the funds to be able to do something there if they want. Uh, he's going into his fourth year. Remember, he was in that same draft class at pick number 33. How do they feel about Andre Cisco? Is that a deal that they could get done? I'm high on Cisco. I don't know if they're as high as I am. I think that's a tough position to find, though. And I think he continues to be an ascending player. He's going into year four. Do you need to do anything? I don't think you need to do anything with either guy. You didn't need to do anything with Trevor Lawrence. But you could do something with both of those guys. Outside of that, I don't see a lot. The only other thing that could happen here is you get a really tasty offer for a tackle. Uh, mm -hmm. whether it's Cam Robinson or a Walker Little or somebody like that. But that would, I think, come closer to the start of the regular season or around the trade deadline. And quite honestly, guys, I think the Jags want all three of these guys on their roster. They want to protect Trevor, their investment as much as possible. And it uh, looks like Walker Little could be the odd man out, at least at the start of the season for that. But they have depth, better depth than maybe anybody in the National Football League. So I'd keep an eye on Campbell, maybe Cisco, um, and, and I would say outside, outside, outside chance of – uh, of a trade move, but it would have to be a really sweet offer, I think, uh, for a guy like Cam Robinson. I don't think he's going anywhere. Um, I'm just trying to think what could happen uh, in terms of the roster over the next couple of months. Two things you mentioned here, Brent. Um, number one, you know, whether this deal got done because of the new stadium stuff coming up, like that could very well be a possibility. Were they trying to get out in front of Brock Purdy, Jordan Love, Dak Prescott, Tua? That could be a possibility as well. I understand that we all think this deal is going to go through, right? And you're getting a new stadium. And it will be the house that Trevor Lawrence built. But I want the house that Trevor Lawrence built to be with bricks that he's laid on the field. Not with bricks that were political, trying to get people to rally and vote. Because I understand, like, you're the face of the franchise and maybe that goes into things. But, like, I don't need Trevor Lawrence to be Mr. Community, Mr. Duval. I just need Trevor Lawrence to be a great quarterback on the football field. Do you run the risk a little bit of like, you know, asking too much of him? Like, hey, Trevor, go out there and make sure people are voting the right way. Hey, Trevor, go out there and make sure you, you know, kiss babies and shake hands. Like, I don't need all of that. All I need the bricks to be built are what he does in the field. So that's my first thing. I'll let you answer it, Brent. Yeah, I don't think so, Austin. I don't think they're going to prop him up like that. I don't think that's fair to him. I don't think mm -hmm. they feel like that's fair to him. I just think this is a little bit of a subconscious thing, probably, uh, you know, and you can kind of say that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you're yeah. Mark Lamping, if, if you're if you're uh, Mayor Donna Deegan and you're presenting this thing and you're fighting through a couple of things and you're like, look, we got look at where we are. We need the one more box. I mean, they've invested in two cornerstone pieces. The football team looks like it's going to be good. You got a Super Bowl winning coach. You get your quarterback into the next decade. I mean, those are nice things to be able to say and sell and, and get us all to buy into, right? I mean, I think we're we're buying in a little bit on that. Uh, I think they could too, especially people that really care about the city, trying to do right by the city. I don't think it's the end all be all. I just want to make that clear. I just think it's a little bit of a uh, one more notch uh, and why not use it in your back pocket now that – it has happened, uh, but I don't think they're going to use him like that, Austin. I don't think mm -hmm. it's fair to him, but I will say this. You're not putting too much pressure on Trevor Lawrence. He understands it. That's what I like about this guy. You could ask that about Zach Wilson. You could ask that about a Trey Lance. You can maybe even ask that about a Justin Fields or a Mac Jones. Nobody, and nobody maybe in the last 10 years, uh, but especially in that draft class, has dealt with the pressure, the weight of the shoulders like Trevor Lawrence has since he was in seventh and eighth grade. Everybody saw this coming. He has lived up to it. 
And I say this all the time, and it's kind of a weird thing to say. He's comfortable in that kind of position. He is a guy that is more comfortable in the position of saying, hey, count on me to get it done than looking around and asking somebody else to get it done. He's got to deliver. But I think he's comfortable in that setting, if that makes sense, um, which is why I think he's such a cool piece to this whole puzzle at 24 years old. We get to watch him grow up. He loves being here. You can already tell he loves the city. He wanted to be here. This is why this thing got done first. Remember you asked that question, Austin? Why this, yeah. Who's going to get the deal done first? This yeah. is why it got done, because they both wanted to get it done. Like This was probably as easy of a negotiation, and I'm just speculating, easy of a negotiation for a deal of this magnitude Maybe there's been. They didn't even use the deadline of camp, which they could have used against each other. They got this thing done a day after minicamp, which mm-hmm. to me showed how much they wanted to get this thing done. But no more. They had plenty of pressure on him. I think he handles it fine, though, and I don't think he cares about that part of it. Brent, the other thing that you mentioned, and real quick, are they playing Connect 4 or Connect 16? But, Casey, you, 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 <laughs> you actually brought this up a little bit, Casey. Um, you know, protecting the asset. Right, making sure Trevor Lawrence is good. And I think we're on the same page here where Travis Etienne's a guy that has helped Trevor Lawrence out immensely. And Brent, you mentioned it. Like, yeah, maybe some next things, maybe Tyson Campbell, maybe Cisco, you know, may- maybe trading up. And- but like, no one's talking about, and I get how the market looks. Like, no one wants to pay a running back any kind of money. Okay, that's just the way that it is. But you have a guy in Travis Etienne who has helped out Trevor Lawrence immensely, number one, a former college teammate, number two. Why is there no talks of, of Travis Etienne getting a new contract? In case I'll let you go first, then we'll let Brent come in here too. Yeah, I, I, I mean, outside of nobody paying their running back other than Christian McCaffrey, I, I think that's the only argument. Like, I think if it, at that position at this point, if you're willing to let Saquon Barkley go, like if that's where we are in the NFL, like if the team that drafted that man second overall is willing to say we're good on your services, even though you can catch the ball, you can run people over, and you can score touchdowns, I just don't think anybody's paying their running back. So that would be my only argument to why there might be nothing there, Brent. But again, I think he's their best player. So you know, there's a reason to maybe re-sign your best player. It's just unfortunate he plays the least valuable position. Yeah, I think uh, this was a, we had a really good conversation back in 1937, Spirits and Eatery, uh, a couple of weeks ago about ETN and paying them. And and if you really want to go back and listen, I won't keep us that long on it. But I actually think, Casey, I agree with you, man. I think he's the most, I've been saying, I think for the last year, I think he's one of the most underrated players in the National Football League, quite frankly. I think he's really a good player. I don't think they helped him out. Now, there's some things he's got to clean up too, but but he's also shown so much growth. I don't think we talk about that in ETN. I mean, he, he got hurt. It was a freaky thing in the first year, been healthy since. He fumbled. He stopped fumbling. Like, there's signs that if he has to fix stuff, he has to get better, he's going to be able to do it. I think this doesn't have to be a mega deal with ETN, but I think you can buy one more year of insurance by doing a deal now with ETN, and mm-hmm. it's not going to break the bank because running backs don't. So I'm kind of with you guys. I would root for that to happen, get one more year of control, because they've got next year or this coming year, 24, and the fifth-year option. I get it's good business. You can just let that play out. But why not get them for 26 as well? And I think we're starting to see running backs hang around even longer and longer. There might be concern about how much he was used in Clemson for way down the road. Uh, but I'm with you guys. Like I would, I would applaud a deal, obviously a reasonable deal uh, with with Travis Etienne. I think that's another guy you could throw in. I just don't feel like the odds are in the favor of that to happen. I think it makes more sense to go sign a cornerback if you really believe in Tyson Campbell or even a safety in Cisco. That probably makes more sense the way the NFL is working these days. But I'd be a big advocate for Etienne. And by the way, could there be a chance that Trevor Lawrence is an advocate for Etienne? Yeah, Remember exactly. now, you get this kind of deal, they're leaning on you. <laughs> or mm-hmm. <laughs> this is your football team. Uh, so um, he does have some say, and he's had some say over the last couple of seasons as well. So they've opened that door up. Brett, to kind of put a bow, uh, as you like to put it, you know, on this topic here a little bit, I'm a little surprised in terms of, I guess, like, I haven't really seen a lot of blow. Like, yeah, obviously Twitter is one thing, right? But from, like, the national pundits, like, I don't see too many people questioning, you know, how much money Trevor Lawrence is making now. I, I don't see people saying, well, why is he making more money than, you know, Justin Herbert? Why is he making more money than Lamar Jackson? And then, I'll be honest, I'm a little surprised by that because Jacksonville, for a lot of the time, seems to be, you know, the butt of all the jokes and everything. And I thought this was going to be a perfect time for – People come after Jacksonville once again and ask, what are you doing? Now, it's not perfect. Some people have opinions about it, but are you a little surprised just how 
the outside world is, is kind of handling the Trevor Lawrence situation? Yeah, I, I've been looking at that too, and I'm seeing a lot of the national headlines. And I've, I don't know an eloquent way to say this, as we've talked about this over the last few months, Casey, but there is this belief, and you, you might watch the national guys even more than me, but there's this belief in Trevor Lawrence. There's a belief that he is good, that when you get labeled generational, when you see some of the things that we've seen, because it's not like we haven't seen upside. I mean, there was a stat out there. I, I can't remember the exact number, but somebody put it out on Twitter. It was like he was 15 and four in a stretch of 19 football games before he got hurt. And the three of the losses were to the Kansas City Chiefs. And, and those weren't like blowout losses, by the way, guys. Like those were losses where the Jags could have won like all three of those games. So, I mean, that's what this deal was built off. That stretch of football where you saw that's what it can look like. We got to get him back there. We got to keep him healthy. We got to put pieces around him, block for him, catch for him, all those things. But that right there, that sample, whatever you want to say, 17 games, 20 games, 19 games, when you go back and I define it, that's why this deal was done. And Casey, I think that's why the national folks always look, also look on that. They're like, this dude was one of the best guys in the league. That's what we were talking about. We were leading every Good Morning Football or CBS uh, this morning or not CBS this morning, but you know, pregame shows and postgame shows and ESPN shows and all these things. And we were talking about this generational talent because it's in there. Now the Jags just have to prove it. And by the way, I think the player gets a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here because the Jags organization over the years hasn't been that great. So you're not going to give the organization benefit. You're going to give the player the benefit to say it's up to the organization to get the best out of him. Yeah, I would also say I think if you take the jersey that he wears out of it and you just say to people, for the second contract that Trevor Lawrence will get in the NFL, if you say this before he was even drafted, plays, whatever, he will be the highest paid quarterback in the sport. I don't think many people are arguing with you because he was labeled generational. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I think if you're talking, to, if you take the teams out of it and all that, I think it almost was like, yeah, okay, I, I could see that. I might not have watched all of Trevor Lawrence play, but from what we heard about him, he was supposed to be great. Clearly he is. So I think there's a part of that. And then I think there's a part of it where I said this when we started the show, the stats will say one thing. The quarterback ranking list will say one thing. I don't think there's an argument to be made that Trevor Lawrence is not a top three talent-wise quarterback in the sport. I think that's why Justin Herbert got paid. The numbers are what they are, but Justin Herbert's extremely talented. I think Trevor Lawrence has shown he can make all the throws. He can make plays. They have not won enough. He's turned it over a little bit. I get it, all those things. But if you're talking strictly talent and what you can do on the football field, I think he's top three at a minimum top five in the sport. So you look at the talent, you look at everything that we'd heard about him coming out, and I think that's why to the national folks it's like, well, yeah, this makes sense. When you sign an edge rusher to a monumental deal like you did with Josh Allen, like it was very easy for us to come on the next day and say, what are expectations now? Right? You have to get, I'm going to need at least 12 sacks from you, Josh. Right? Like that, that, That's going to be on point with what we need from you. Hopefully the defensive line around you can elevate their play as well. That's what it looks like when it says you're earning your money, it's working. We have established with the quarterback position, it's different. It's not all stat-driven. It's more of what can the team do around you as well. So a question for both of you guys now. Now that Trevor Lawrence, you can say he is the highest-paid quarterback in the NFL, tied for first with Joe Burrow right now on an average salary yearly basis. What does Trevor Lawrence have to do this year? I, I get down the line, yeah, Super Bowls, we're celebrating all that stuff, but let's take it one step at a time. You have to walk before you can run. What does it need to look like this year for Trevor Lawrence, for us to say, you know what? That was money well spent, and it's working. I think it's three things, guys. Uh, he's got to clean up the fumbles, right? You got to be well, – what I said about Travis Etienne, I appreciate that about a player, when they kind of clean up something that they weren't doing well. I can – I see why the fumbles have happened, most of them. I think some of them have been a little goofy, too. Clean it up. Stop fumbling the football. Stop giving it away. Make smarter decisions, right? Live another down, all those kind of things. I think that's important. Get them back in the playoffs and take over the AFC South and have a chance at the dance. That's all. I mean, I can't predict that you're going to go to the AFC championship game. That's too hard to do. It's a loaded AFC. And then the last one uh, is just flat out win. I mean, mm. like a sooner or later, we're going to, you're going to have to win. But I mean, you, I shouldn't say that's not, I mean, that's probably a down the road, like win, win, you know, first of all, get back in, win, win. But I'll give you one more because you say this, Austin, so I'll appease you here. And I think you're right, though. Oh, please. I, about it. I love being um, appeased. I, I, I think he has to have – and I don't know if this is the year you have to do it, and maybe it can be moderate level. I think you do have to get into the 30s throwing touchdowns. And I think you have to be around 10, 11, 12 picks or less. 
Like, I think you have to have one of those years because to me, what separated it, like the Burroughs and Herberts, Herbert, I just saw this morning, his record's like 30 and 33. Yet mm -hmm. we've crowned that guy, right? I mean, the reason why is because people love fantasy football and stats. So you got to appease that part of the population to say, hey, 32 and 11 is a really good year, right? And maybe you get someday to 38 and nine or something like that. But if he could come out of the gates this year and go 30 plus and, and low teens picks and limit the, the fumbles, and then on top of that, get them back in the playoffs. Checkbox, checkbox, checkbox. To me, those are like three things that would make everybody feel good, Casey. Yeah, I think the fumbling is is extremely important because I think at times you can live with interceptions. Not a ton of them, not a Jameis Winston scenario, but <laughs> I think you can live with some if it's like I'm trying to have Brian Thomas Jr. make a play, you know it didn't work. Like You can live with those. The fumbles you can't live with, so I'm with you there, Brent. But I think this year it's simply you need to overtake Houston because now you're paying your guys like they're the best in the division, so mm -hmm. do it. And you got to win a playoff game. Mm. I, I think you do. If you're, if you have the coach who we think you do in Doug Peterson, if you have the highest paid quarterback in the sport, because I'll say this to you: with Joe Burrow coming back healthy, they're expecting to win playoff games, and mm -hmm. he's the high, they're tied highest paid quarterback in the sport. So if you're the Jags, you are expected, in my opinion, to figure out how to get back over Houston and win a playoff game because. That's what you've committed yourself to. You're paying a defensive player huge money. You're paying a quarterback huge money. You have a coach that you think is is damn good. You got to figure out how to do it this year. You can't. I don't think just getting there is good enough. I really don't. Yeah. Because last year they should have been there if they didn't totally collapse. Hey, uh, by the way, uh, I'm back in a big way considering we're blowing through commercial breaks uh, instead of and just going. Oh no, no, we're, we're, nice we're, we're, no. <laughs> we're, we're all good, man. But um, I, I think Nick, we okay for a couple more minutes. Yeah, we're fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> real quick though, Brent. So you know, obviously, this is a big thing for Jaguars fans now. That the weight is off everyone's back. We can move on. Fantastic. What does the rest of the NFL look like now, though, in terms of guys like Tua? In terms of guys like Jordan Love, like, are they about to eclipse Trevor Lawrence? Or are we going to say, wow, you kind of got a Christian Kirk deal when it's all said and done? Or did Trevor Lawrence set a precedent, become the highest paid player, and now everyone's got to kind of fall in line accordingly below him? That's a really good question. Uh, I, I do think, guys, um, I'm going to keep pounding this. I know everybody's looking at that $55 million and equating it to Burrow. I just saw another Spotrack, I think, tweeted it. I retweeted it. The number to look at is percentage on the cap, right? Because we're talking about inflation. And I think that's an important thing to continue. I didn't think about it until recently. And I think that's where the agents work off. And so when we're looking at these deals, I think it's important because the, the cap keeps going up. And so, I mean, look, look at Mac with the poll. Nice. Sorry, Brett. Great job, Nick. I mean, he's <laughs> he's a tenth. I mean, he's a tenth quarterback in the league based on this, right? And so, if if we had said the average year is tenth in the league or eighth in the league or something like, nobody would be like, "Oh my gosh, look what Trevor! Look at the deal they did with Trevor!" So, I just think this is an important number. I know it's math. Hamby's not here. We can all succeed. <laughs> uh, but Trevor Lawrence, fifty-five million, is more like sixty-plus million for Burrow in today's dollar, uh, the way the NFL is. So that's important. And that means, to answer your question, Austin, Tua, Dak Prescott, Jordan Love are probably going to slot right in around Trevor Lawrence and be in that same category. I think he set the precedent. I don't know how much people will eclipse. This was a lot of guaranteed money, $200 million, I think 142 at signing. I don't. Where are they going to make the numbers look better for their clients? I don't know. But I think Trevor's agent did a heck of a job of making his client a lot of money. And, and the numbers look real, but also palatable for the Jags. I saw another tweet, and I know we're going crazy with numbers, but after this, because this is an extension, guys. So this year and next right. year under the fifth year, well, really this year in 24, after that, this averages out to, I think, high 40s over the length of the contract if you count all that in. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on how you want to interpret this, how the Jags spread the money out how flexible they can be with the cap. I think those are things that are hard for all of us to understand. We can make pretend we do, but they have actual cap people that try to figure that stuff out, Casey. Hey, uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And talking about numbers, Brent, uh, I just want to remind you, uh, back in the old spot, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, there was a conversation between me, you, and uh, Double H, as we used to call him, uh, and you said there was no scenario where Burrow was getting 55. You were lost. You lost that bet. 
And then we said Trevor Lawrence is going to be in the 55 category. You said no way, no how. So I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, Brent, you owe me $500 again for that. I don't Dang. know. Like the OGs of the show will I, remember this. We wrote dude's it on, on a piece vacation. of paper. Yeah, you owe me like 500 bucks, dog. Sorry about that. You couldn't wait to get back to town? Oh, hey. No, actually, by the way, this is probably a good time to do it. I'm putting everything on a 0% pay it off for 21 month credit card right now. So <laughs> might as well put another 500 on it. What the heck? My dog, um, appreciate that. So it is, it is a, it's a free continental breakfast here, though, as you guys can tell. Um, <laughs> free I, games, I feel, too. Like. <laughs> I feel like that conversation was like pushing 60 million by you and Aaron, if I'm not mistaken. No, but, no, oh. I think it's 55. Is, is there audio? I mean, is there <laughs> Oh, there's definitely audio. Every oh, show proof? we've ever done is still right. on YouTube. Well, then. Go back and find it, Casey. It's written down. We just got to find the paper that he wrote it down on, but I'm pretty sure it was 500 bucks. We did a lot of $500 <laughs> hey, bets gonna, last year. 